It's said that a rising tide lifts all boats. That's usually considered a good thing. But what if the economic growth that the expression refers to actually results in widespread flooding, to continue the metaphor, acting as a driving force behind ecological destruction? Well, with us to explore the potential risks of endless economic expansion, we welcome, in Montreal, Quebec, via Skype, Chris Reagan. He's the director of McGill University's Max Bell School of Public Policy and a former chair of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission. In the nation's capital, Céline Back, president of Analytica Advisors and a senior associate with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And in our studio here, Atif Kabursi, professor emeritus of economics at McMaster University. Peter Victor, professor emeritus of environmental studies at York University and the author of Managing Without Growth, Slower by Design, Not Disaster. And Sarah Kaplan, director at the U of T's Institute for Gender and the Economy at the Rotman School of Management and the author of The 360 Corporation, From Stakeholder Trade-Offs to Transformation. And it's great to have all of you both here in the studio and in Points Beyond for this very timely discussion, which I'm going to set up by reading the following quotes. Here's American economist Kenneth Boulding, who said in 1973, anyone who believes that exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> That's a pretty good line. <laughs> Environmentalist good one. Edward Ab Abbey wrote in 1977, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. And then, of course, this past year, Greta Thunberg said at the UN Climate Action Summit, this very... Uh, much quoted and very famous line, people are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing, we are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Let's get into this. Peter, to you first. 97% of climate scientists believe climate change is human-caused, and I suspect the same percentage of economists believe we need economic growth. You're not one of them. How come? Well, I think that the, the, the record is pretty clear that economic growth, uh, to the extent we've pursued it, has done such damage to the biosphere. Uh, you've already mentioned climate change, uh, loss of species, flooding, and the, the future looks a lot worse if we continue on this path. So what I think is that uh, it's quite possible for an economy such as Canada's to manage without growth and still provide people with a very satisfactory standard of living and reduce the pressure on the biosphere. And I think it's about time that we moved in that direction. Atif, are you also one of those who is not obsessed with the need for constant economic growth? Unfortunately, I am. It's absolutely the case that we have to ask, what for is economic growth? To what end? In the name of economic growth, we destroyed villages, we spoiled the environment, uh, we created wars, uh, we have tolerated incredible, uh, inequitable distribution of income and wealth, and uh, went on to spoil the very basis, uh, challenging the very existence of this uh, planet. And to what extent do we really need to continue going with growth without asking the question, are there other objectives that we need to pursue? And to what extent is economic growth now in conflict with these objectives? I need someone from the Rotman School to come back on that then. If we had no more economic growth, what do you suspect would be the impact on the Ontario and then slash Canadian economy? Well, I think this conversation about no growth is really important because it causes us to think about, well, what would society have to look like? But the concern that I think if I have to wear the pro-growth uh, hat would be that economic growth is something that creates space for innovations, for new technologies to come in and maybe solve some of these problems, that organizations, when they, uh, they need to grow in order to give people kind of career paths that allow them to work hard and imagine a kind of future. And so without economic growth, the concern is we won't have the resources to pay for the kinds of transformations that we need to pay for. On the other hand, I think if you just assume that growth is the only answer without having this kind of conversation that we're having, we may go in a very toxic direction, which is the warning that's being raised right now. Celine, I'll ask you to pick up the story at that point. What do you imagine would be the ramifications of a no-growth economy? Uh, well, first of all, you know, one of the reasons why we monitor growth is because it's a sign of confidence in the economy, and confidence is what enables credit, and credit is what it is you know, when it's tied to the real economy is what is what enables uh, investments to be made in productive use and so uh, productive um, opportunities for Canada include um, getting us to, you know, on a path of a great deal more productivity for the resources that we use 
Um, I, I uh, for uh, the purposes of this um, uh, this session today, I, I went and looked up um, our, our uh, carbon productivity compared to uh, northern climate neighbors, like the, the C7, we can call it for the moment. And we have a lot of opportunity in terms of increasing our productivity on a carbon uh, footprint basis. Our, ours is three and a half times uh, more intense. Our use of carbon is three and a half times more intense than that of Sweden and uh, two, two times more intense than that of Norway and Finland. Uh, and we're 50 percent uh, you know, more uh, more spendthrifts than, than Iceland in terms of the way we use energy in this country. So there's lots of opportunity for us to invest in, in the productivity of our resources, including energy. Okay, Chris, I'll get you to weigh in now. What do you think uh, of the advisability of moving to a no-growth economy? Well, let's be clear what we mean by growth. What we typically mean by growth is growth in GDP, gross domestic product, or national income, uh, which is the sum of everybody's income. I think it's really important to make the distinction between uh, no growth or maybe even degrowth on the one hand and better growth on the other hand. Uh, so we've heard mention of uh, environmental degradation, environmental damage, and I am very concerned about that. We've also heard from, I think, Atif about rising income inequality, and I think that is a very serious problem as well. I actually think it's possible to design policies that can actually be directed at improving environmental outcomes and at improving income distribution uh, that aren't actually damaging to growth. I think you, I don't think it's automatic. I think you've got to do it carefully. Uh, and I do worry actually that policies that are actively designed to reduce growth might actually uh, make at least one of those income inequality actually worse. So I, I think we've got to avoid this sort of polarized debate about pro-growth or anti-growth. I think we've got to think about better growth and think about policies that can be used to address those. Okay, Peter, you've heard some pushback. What do you want to come back with? Well, I think it's pretty clear that we absolutely we need a reduction in the use of materials and energy and the discharge of greenhouse gases and other pollutants. So it's not even a question of no growth. There, I think... Most people who are concerned about the environment realize we've got to reduce the pressure on the biosphere. Now, the question is, can you do that more easily if the economy is growing than if it's not growing? And I think the argument is pretty clear that it's easier to um, reduce the total amount of emissions of greenhouse gases going into the environment if the economy is not growing than if it is growing. We need all the efficiency gains that Celine and Chris have, have mentioned, but those efficiency gains have to be that much greater if the economy is growing than if it's not growing. And so... Um, and when you look at the numbers, it, it's absolutely really quite depressing. If we're going to get to uh, zero net emissions, as the government of Canada has said, by 2050, we've got to our emissions per dollar of GDP uh, by about 10% a year, every year from now till then. That's an astonishing astonishingly ambitious goal that I think is way beyond the argument that we, we'll, we'll just keep growing anywhere and we'll somehow get there. Well, having said that, Atif, if you look between 1990 and 2015, more than a billion people in this world, many would argue thanks to pro-growth policies, have been lifted out of abject poverty to the point where they now have somewhat of a better life. Uh, that's a pretty good economic success, success story, and it's attributed to pro-growth policies? Well, maybe one has to look at it in a different way. First of all, we tend to always talk about economics as if it's totally isolated from the society within which it's rooted or the environment. To the extent that we are depleting resources, uh, depleting non-renewable resources that we cannot replace, to the extent that we probably are uh, harvesting renewable resources beyond their maximum sustainable yields. Look, in Canada, we destroyed totally the cut fishery. Uh, to the extent that we are fouling the environment, uh, the issue is not within economics. Yes, there are definitely policies that would give you better income distribution with growth. But if you put it within that greater framework, we're doing it at the expense of a viable environment hmm. against a sustainable life. And, and these are issues that we really need to take seriously. Sarah? Well, I just think if an example of the tension that this uh, relates to is, for example, the BP oil spill in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. 11 people died, 3 billion, you know, or uh, gallons of oil poured in. But it actually led to GDP growth because there was, it was extremely costly to clean it up. <clears throat> so if we're thinking about 
these kinds of issues, we have to look at those trade-offs. And what I've been trying to think about is how do we encompass not just this measures of pure economic growth, because in that case, we really didn't want that economic growth, but how can we look at all the different measures that we could think of as well-being in the economy and then look at innovative solutions that address multiple dimensions as opposed to a single dimension of GDP growth or growth within the firm. So yeah. that's the way that I've been trying to think about it. I know we have a lot of economists here, but I'm going to quote yet another one. Here's Paul Krugman writing in the New York Times about advocates for a no-growth economy. Sheldon, mm -hmm. want to bring this graphic up? They don't understand what economic growth means. They think of it as a crude physical thing, a matter simply of producing more stuff and don't take into account the many choices about what to consume, about which technologies to use that go into producing a dollar's worth of GDP. So here's what you need to know. Climate despair is all wrong. The idea that economic growth and climate action are incompatible may sound hard-headed and realistic, but it's actually a fuzzy-minded misconception. If we ever get past the special interests and ideology that have blocked action to save the planet, we'll find that it's cheaper and easier than almost anyone imagines. Okay, I gotta go to Celine first and then we'll get everybody else to comment on that. Um, do, do you think, Celine, that, that growth and climate action are compatible? Well, first of all, I should say that it would be uh, really good news if we had zero growth at the moment, um, and that was attributed, attributable to climate action. Um, that's not the case. Emissions are rising in Canada, they're rising globally, and this is obviously a very grave concern. Um, we, we are still, our, our, our financial system is still very much um, attuned to financing the economy of the past, and we're not yet to the point where our banking system and our investment investments are aligned with the opportunities that I described earlier, um, and so uh, you know there is a th there's a conundrum there, and and I think uh, there are there are some uh, eminent economists, many of whom have Nobel prizes, who have argued both sides of that of that question. I think we need to very very soon come to terms with the fact that at the moment we have. Of financing banking uh, that is uh, for uh, re for non-renewable sources of energy for hydrocarbons that are the cause uh, primary cause of climate change that are in the case of a 1.5 degree scenario 120 percent of what is going to be possible and needed so we we can we can I think if we align the financial system and credit and the ability to invest in the real economy including the innovations we're discussing we can, I think, make that uh, change happen. But if not, we're, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we're going to actually have to pay to remove the carbon from the air. And that's at the, at the very root of Greta Thunberg's advocation to us all. Like, don't leave us, my generation, my children's generation, don't leave us to grow our way into paying for removing the carbon out of the air, which should never have gone into the atmosphere in the first place. Hmm. Let's get Chris and then Sarah on this. Well, your question was, can we have growth and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And my answer is absolutely yes. Uh, Krugman likes to <laughs> write things with a little bit of an edge to it, uh, uh, but I'm pretty sure that he would be in favor of broad-based economy-wide carbon pricing. Uh, the Ecofiscal Commission, which uh, is now over, but I chaired for its duration, um, has written several reports on how we can have uh, well-designed carbon prices in this country, uh, and by extension in other countries, how that, that kind of policy can reduce greenhouse gas emissions very significantly and have almost no impact on, on overall economic growth. One of the things that's in Krugman's quote that's very important is that the nature of GDP, the nature, the nature of our production and our income changes and changes drastically over time. A hundred years ago, 45% uh, of Canadian uh, labor force were on the farm. Uh, today, it's less than 2%, but 80% of Canadian employment today is in services. Services is uh, dramatically less energy intensive and carbon intensive than manufacturing and agriculture. So as the economies change, we do actually change the nature of output. Uh, but the short answer, Steve, is absolutely. We can continue economic growth and reduce greenhouse gas emissions dramatically. The nature of our growth will change. We will do more of less carbon intensive things and less of more carbon intensive things. But overall GDP growth can continue. Sarah and then Atif. 
So I uh, want to pick up on something that Krugman says almost as a throwaway at the end, which is if we could just get around the kind of people who are resisting change. And I think that's the important thing to think about is that we have, we have a set of assumptions in the existing system. And under those assumptions, it's very hard to imagine a scenario other than the kind of scenario that maybe Chris is talking about. But I, 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 I feel like we need to also pay attention to the fact that there are those many forces that are resisting. Mm -hmm. And so he says it as a throwaway, but that's actually what I think we need to be doing is Celine talking about uh, the fact that the financial system hasn't caught up with our needs yet. We need innovation, not just product innovation, but innovation in how we finance things and things like that if we're going to get around the, the barriers that Krugman talked about in his quotes. So, Teeth then yeah. Peter. Yeah. Uh, the trouble with the argument uh, that uh, Krugman has advanced is that choices are, yes, there, you know, between products, uh, between what we produce, what we consume, and how we produce it. But there are broader choices. Uh, choices between material life and non-material life, between the fact that GDP is not highly correlated with every good outcome we like. Uh, we have countries like uh, Sri Lanka, where the life expectancy is far longer than what its GDP would have predicted. Uh, the United Nations has been so dissatisfied with the yeah. fixation on GDP that they design something called HDI, Human Development Index, uh, where they take variables other than GDP, uh, the level of education, life expectancy. And many people are un unhappy with this. Uh, the word happiness has never really <laughs> ever come into it. You know, there are countries like Bhutan who probably are happier without the GDP that goes with it. The story here is that we're getting into existential choices, that the material life, pursuit of material life now is at the expense of existence itself. And we have to take these things seriously and see what we can do with it. Peter Victor. So one of the problems with the priority that we give to economic growth is that whenever anybody proposes something else for environmental purposes or to improve the distribution of income, the question is, what will that do for growth? So growth is not just something we decide whether we want or not. It, the pursuit of it is impeding our capacity to achieve all of these other goals that others, others have mentioned. It's a bit of a religion, eh? It's very much a religion, and I, I'm afraid it's a religion that uh, far too many economists still seem to subscribe to. Um, so that would be one uh, important point. The second thing is, if we were to continue growth at 3% a year, and by the way, the question of moving to a service economy, Chris has very well explained. We've already done a lot of that, and yet our greenhouse gas emissions still keep growing. So obviously that's not the answer. Now, if the economy was to grow at 3% a year for the next 25 years, it would double in size. Now, if everything stayed much the same, we would double greenhouse gas emissions. That's obviously a cat catastrophic, but simply to keep our greenhouse gas emissions constant under those circumstances, we would have to halve the greenhouse gas emissions per dollar. All the technolo oh, yeah. technology we're hearing about can contribute to that, but that would just keep us where we are. We've got to reduce emissions dramatically. So to think we can do that while the economy continues to expand and expand, given all of the changes in the way people spend their money, just the sorts of things Krugman seems to want to uh, hang his hat on, I think is just taking us precisely down the wrong path. Yeah. Chris Reagan, I should give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I agree that we should not put all of our attention and all of our policy focus on GDP growth. Um, you know, when I teach at the Max Bell School, I ask my students uh, to show of hands if they would like their personal income to rise. And every single one of them says yes. And that's the argument for increasing GDP, because that's just what GDP is. It's the sum of everybody's income. But then I asked them a second question, which is, put your hand up if the only thing you care about is your personal income. And nobody puts their hand up, which is good. It's a very good sign. Uh, so we care about income, and we should. But we also care about many other things. So uh, if, if the argument is we shouldn't focus only on GDP growth, I completely agree. We should focus on other things as well, but we don't want to ignore GDP growth. But Peter's second statement about, about greenhouse gas emissions. So to me, the, the, the question is, what kinds of policies can we put in place that will 
achieve the kind of dramatic greenhouse gas emissions reductions that Peter is talking about. I think Peter and I would probably be on very close to the same page in terms of the kinds of emissions reductions that we like and would need uh, over the next 30 or 50 years. Uh, to me, the challenge is how do we design policies that do that? I mentioned carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is not the only kind of policy, but whatever policies we design, I think we should you know, get to it and design those policies stringently, but also design those policies to achieve their outcome in a low-cost way. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do that. Atif yeah. Kabursi wants to follow yeah, up. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that one of the major arguments about pro-growth and its compatibility with the environment rests on its excessive belief in the capacity of technology to save us. And this is really a problem because one uh, good economist friend of Peter who said really you can't cook something with just the recipe. You need resources, the continuous re need of resources. And some of these resources you can't substitute for. You could substitute for oil, natural gas or wind. You could substitute for many uh, resources. But can you substitute for water? There is one constraint that's going to be a critical constraint that is going to thwart every effort we have uh, to believe that we can continuously grow and substitute things and rationalize and reconcile the conflicting demands on uh, society. Well, Sarah, let me get you in here on another angle of this, which is we've been talking mostly about what the potential ramifications are of a no-growth economy on the first world. Right. But if we look at income inequality and we look at the developing world, right. Can we imagine what the impact of never mind six or eight or nine percent growth rates in China or India, which they have been accustomed to over the last many years? What about zero and what the impact on that might be? Well, I think that's the uh, important issue about this debate because it's all well and good for those of us sitting here in the studio or on the on the on the line to say we need less stuff, right? But there's a lot of people who still need more stuff. <laughs> if we look at uh, First Nations people in even northern Canada, uh, if we look at people in Appalachia or Flint, Michigan, no less people in Bangladesh, Malawi, Vietnam. So it's, you know, one thing for us to say, now we need to tone it down just when we have the levels of comfort and now that is going to have these ramifications. Now, I'm not saying that that's a justification for us doing a huge environmental damage as we grow, but I think we have to also take into account, you know, if we go to no growth, it could be that the people in positions of privilege will hoard that privilege and that will actually have huge uh, ramifications for people who aren't in positions of privilege. I should get Celine on that. We've got billions of people in the, de in the developing world that want to grow economically and mm -hmm. prosper just as we have. Sarah just indicated that. Can that growth, though, be greener than the growth that clearly we have not seen in terms of a green economy here so far? Well, that's obviously the premise of the Paris Agreement, and it's also the premise behind the idea that, that um, countries and regions okay. that have had more than their fair share of uh, historical emissions should pay a greater share of uh, the, the zero growth development in developing countries. And, and Climate Action Network Canada has produced, uh, I think, a very interesting perspective on that, suggesting that, you know, in fact, we should decarbonize um, to the point where we, we go beyond zero um, in order to compensate for the fact that we've had uh, you know, access to energy uh, which, has, which has filled up the, the, the atmosphere and the balloon uh, where we have a limited amount of room for CO2 emissions. Um, at a practical level, I would say that one of the things that really impedes uh, zero or low carbon growth in developing countries is, again, access to credit. Um, it's uh, surprisingly expensive to get access to credit for yeah. renewable energy projects and other uh, low carbon projects in, in some of the countries that Sarah mentioned earlier. Vietnam is a, is, is a place where you know, coal power plants are being built today um, because it's cheaper to do that. And that is actually surprising to, to us, right, because we, we know now that, uh, that renewable energy, wind and solar, are cheaper to deploy in advanced economies uh, than is the case for combined heat and power with natural gas as well as coal. So there's a lot of work to do in order to establish the confidence in the economies, in the banking systems of developing countries so that they can actually have that low cost um, energy uh, and, and zero emitting energy, which is 
that the root of, of building a, a better life for people who are, you know, whose countries are at the beginning of their development pathway. Peter Victor. Yes, I just want to say that the work I've done on managing without growth over the years has been focused very much on the rich countries. And partly the motivation for that is to make some more space for poorer countries to develop and grow. So uh, it's not it's not a position which says nobody should have growth anywhere. Now, I would go one step further and say that um, by most measures, rich countries are making it very, very difficult for poor countries countries to develop because of the pressure we're putting on the biosphere. For example, the ecological footprint measures suggest we'd need nearly four Earths if everybody on the planet was going to live like Canadians. Hmm. So we are overusing our, our, our presence on the, on the biosphere is so great that we are, in fact, depriving poorer countries of the ability to develop. And I think it needs to be seen that way. So when it comes to recognizing where humanity as a whole has a problem, who should go first in backing off? Well, surely the rich countries yeah. should, be, should take the lead and say, OK, we've reached a very high standard of living. Uh, distribution is not reasonable. There are lots of things to change. I really like Celine's emphasis on the, on the money system, the credit system, and how we're going to finance a lot of investment, frankly, that won't be profitable, uh, that will have tremendous environmental payoffs but won't necessarily result in a positive cash flow. We've got to find ways to finance that. So there's a great menu of activities. It includes uh, the carbon price and the, that Chris has done such a good job on. Um, we've got a whole agenda of actions, but I think they'll only come to, to, to be if we take our eye off the growth in GDP as the most important economic principle and say, OK, what's the full range of things that we want to satisfy? Yeah. Well, there is a, a major issue in the whole discourse of sustainable development. Uh, we tend to emphasize that we have to be uh, helpful to future generations. We should not consume and destroy the environment and be with to the future generation a world that would not be amenable to them to maximize or to uh, live comfortably in it. Uh, this presupposes something that has been forgotten, that I cannot ask the poor person in the third world uh, to sacrifice so that my grandchild in a rich country is going to live an amenable and sustainable life. It presupposes that this intergenerational equity requires an intrageneration equity. We need exactly the first world to yield so space so that these people in the third world, and there is a, a a good empirical curve called the Kuznet curve, that, that in some of these poor countries, even when they grow, they are likely to improve the, the environment rather than to think. But only in that context of redistribution, in that context of an intragenerational equity that preserves it. I hear you, but I wonder, Sarah, if there aren't a bunch of people watching this right now who are thinking to themselves, you know, we talk about the rich first world countries, and they don't feel rich, and they don't feel mm -hmm like they're dramatically better off than some of the people in the developing country that we're talking about right now. How does this work for them? Well, there are many people in even developed countries who are not doing as well. And I, so I think that this question of redistribution has to be within our countries as well as across countries. I think one of just tying together some of the comments that have been made before about this idea of growth and something Celine raised as well is that if we treat the need to drive growth as the gating factor, like we won't do anything unless we can prove growth or unless we can prove a financial return, as, as Peter was talking about, we'll never get any of these oh, innovative solutions. However, it often turns out, and this is true in the corporate world, that if you actually pursue something because it's going to be good for the environment or something else, later it turns out that it's actually really good for profits or other things. But they would have never done it if their first requirement was profits or growth. And so I think that we... If we always stop these conversations with, oh, this will reduce growth, then we'll never be able to get to the innovative ideas that have been discussed around this table. Yeah. I'm going to read something here from Warwick Smith, who's a research economist at the uh, progressive think tank per capita, who wrote this in The Guardian. And Chris Reagan, I'll give you the first chance to respond to this one. Here comes the quote. You may be surprised to hear that there's really good news in all this. None of the stuff we're doing that's destroying the biosphere is making us happy. By contrast, changing to a more sustainable way of living will also bring us greater happiness and general well-being. Seem too good to be true? Well, that's because we've all been so effectively sold the line that endless growth is essential to maintain and improve our quality of life. This couldn't be further from the truth. 
Material prosperity has diminishing returns when it comes to happiness and well-being. Once we have good access to food, shelter, health care, and other basic material things, the nature of the community in which you live and the quality of your relationships is the best predictor of well-being. More stuff only makes a very marginal difference. Chris, your take on that? I think I largely agree with it. Um, so I want to come back to differences about material well-being uh, across countries. So we know there are uh, still many, many poor people in the world. But even those differences within a country like Canada, a rich country like Canada, there are still many poor people here. Uh, but I think it's true. I mean, I think maybe most of us around the table would probably value an extra hour of leisure more than we would value an extra few dollars of income. Uh, we just somehow seem to <laughs> not be able to figure out how to do that. And I wish I could solve that problem. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I guess, so the idea that our happiness comes from more than material well-being strikes me as being true and obviously true. Um, I think what we need to do then is to say, what is the policy action that comes from that? And are you going to use, uh, are you going to use government policy to uh, impose on the way that, you know, how many hours people work? Or are you going to impose on how many weeks they work? Are you going to force people to consume less? Or, you know, I'm not quite sure what yeah. you're going to do other than having all of us somehow realize in, you know, deep within ourselves that what, you know, we would be happier if we had less stuff and had more time with our family. I believe that. I just don't quite know where that takes the finance minister or the prime minister or, you know, the, the head of the central bank. Atif. Yeah. One of the great contributions of Peter is that he emphasized the need to situate the economy within the biosphere and take the constraints of biosphere. You're talking about this Peter here? This Peter. Okay. <laughs> but but as, there is, as mentioned in his book, Managing Without Growth, Slower by Design, yeah. Not Disaster, right. available at better bookstores yeah. everywhere. But there is There's your plug for the day. <laughs> <laughs> there is another dimension I want to throw, and this is to situate the economy within the cultural context. There are so many different cultures. We tend as economists to think culture is not important or culture is one superior culture and we all have to emulate. Uh, to a great extent, this seems to be the dominant discourse. We have to all advance and become as rich as the first world. Why isn't it that we take other cultures that had valued non-material life and had pursued different alternatives and valued other aspects than just the mindless pursuit of accumulation. Uh, this would maybe a way in, in the sense that you could be content uh, with less and maybe value social life, family life, uh, leisure, and other things. To the extent we keep driven by this cultural imperialism, sorry to use that, <laughs> in which we would always have to emulate and succumb and copy the, well, the, the West, <clears throat> uh, maybe we have no way out. Is that a heretical point of view for someone who teaches at Rotman? No, I think there's a lot more diversity at Rotman than you think, and I'm actually a sociologist and not an <laughs> economist, so uh, I will say sociologists have talked for a long time about the fact that economic measures like GDP don't account for all sorts of things, like, for example, care work or leisure or all these other kinds of things. And I think one of the, one of the first paths forward would be, would be really emphasizing these other kinds of measures, like what you said, the ADI, HDI, some people call it the general progress indicator. If we were actually accounting for, and I say this in my work on gender too, for the care work, the unpaid care work at home, and we, we thought more broadly about all of the measures of what's going on in our lives, then growth would mean something very different under that context. Um, so yes, I think part of it is, uh, as Chris said, us thinking differently about this problem. GDP is only something that got in, you know, created in the 1930s. It's mm -hmm. not like GDP has been something out there forever. It was something that humans created as a limited way to measure a certain kind yeah. of economic activity. But we could create something else. Peter, I do want you to speak to this angle, though. If we have a no-growth economy, mm -hmm. and presumably that means we have less tax revenue flowing into the federal and provincial coffers, presumably, what does that mean in terms of trying to take on, for example, the health care challenges of the future where we presumably are going to need a lot more money to deal with the health challenges of a graying generation, uh, I mean, fill in the blanks, et cetera, et cetera, right? Right, right. 
Well, I've looked at this in some detail uh, in the book you happened to mention a little while ago. <laughs> um, and what I do is I, I build uh, simulation models to look at possible futures under, under different assumptions. Uh, if you look at a base case of just trying to carry along down the track we're on, it's disastrous. Um, and, and I just want to add an aside here. It's not just climate change. Uh, it's biodiversity loss, it's acidification of the oceans, it's, it's uh, uh, accumulation of nitrogen in the, in, in the, in the uh, bio, biophysical cycles and so on. We've got a lot of environmental problems. They talk about nine planetary boundaries, so it's not just a climate change problem. Now, as to governments needing tax money, well, you see, that's one of the advantages of doing a simulation model. You include tax receipts in it, you include government expenditures. <coughs> and if in one of my scenarios where we slow down the rate of growth until it's not, the economy is not growing at all, we're actually better off than we are today. We're just not as rich as we would have been if we had pursued a growth rate of 2 3 4% indefinitely into the future. So when you say the government will have less tax money, it's less than what? Not less than we have now, not less, but less than what we would have if we were successful in that awful pursuit of a never-ending economic growth, where we would definitely need even more money to solve our problems. Yeah, okay. So it's finding that balance between a slower rate of growth, maybe no growth, maybe, maybe degrowth, hmm. and then how we allocate the output of the economy to the different things that we need. And, and all around the table, I think you've heard examples of misallocation of expenditures if what we really want is well-being. Now, can I just add one other thing? There are three countries now which have identified themselves as the well-being alliance. Finland, Iceland, and, and uh, yeah. Scotland. 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 Okay. Scotland. And, yeah, yeah. and they have, the, and now we're talking about the government. Uh, Chris was saying, what would you say to the prime minister? Their prime ministers have said, what really matters in our countries is well-being. Mm -hmm. And they have explicitly said that that is not uh, to be confused with growth in GDP. In which case, um, Chris, should we not just start a campaign today that says we are not allowed to mention the letters GDP anymore? We've got to come up with something. Well, we already have other alternatives. Yeah, yeah. They've been mentioned on this program already. And that ought to be what informs government policy decisions going forward. Can we do that? Uh, I think you shouldn't do that. But, but, but I'll make a friendly amendment to your proposal. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think you want to ignore GDP. GDP is a very good measure of the thing that it was designed to measure. It certainly has some problems, but it was never designed to be a measure of well-being or happiness yeah. okay. or, you know, it just wasn't designed to be that. It was a measure of the value of goods and services flowing through markets. Uh, and for example, if the government wants to be able to make a forecast of where it's tax revenues will go over the next five years, uh, knowing where GDP will go is a pretty pretty important thing. Yeah. But my friendly amendment is, should we be talking about other things? And should we be thinking about other things, whether it's a you know an index of social well-being, when we are designing policies? Absolutely. So let's put more emphasis on the non-income things that matter for life. Yeah. Uh, and let's get the finance minister to do that, and the industry minister to do that, and the prime right. minister to do that, and everybody else. But let's not ignore GDP. Yeah. Celine, you're going to sign on to that friendly amendment? Uh, well, actually, I'm going to say I think it's an interesting co uh, coincidence that, it, that Finland was the sponsor for the finance minister's first meeting uh, at a climate at, at the COP in Madrid. And um, maybe humbly say that I proposed that a couple of years ago, that uh, finance ministers need to be uh, in, the, in uh, you know, a very active role in regards to uh, living an economy that, that enables us to live, live within the biosphere. I guess I would add um, to Peter's proposal that there are ecological goods and services that uh, should be included in GDP. The nature provides services that, that are valuable, flood mitigation, pollution um, management and control. In many, in many cases, indigenous communities and farmers and stewards of the land take care of those things. And that's not included in GDP. So um, I think we need to make GDP work for us rather than the other way around. And, and I maintain that GDP is important in terms of it's indi an indication of confidence. And confidence is what enables credit. And credit, if directed properly, is what enables us to invest in the real zero carbon economy. OK, got about a minute and a half to go here. So quick comment from you, quick comment from you. Very quickly, I would uh, sign on to the uh, Friendly amendment? amendment? Yes. <laughs> Only if I know what the other things are. Because we tend to a great extent 
take GDP and get all these things that are correlated with it. I'd like to be a much broader one, one that is not ethnocentric that, uh, it, it, look, to some extent, the HDI is supposed to be a major improvement. This is of, the happiness? Uh, no, no, HDI is a human development Human index. development, okay. But the story is, uh, we, at one time, Canada was the top, and every country is measured how close it is to Canada. That's the whole measure. By itself, it's a very dubious uh, situation. I like to include leisure. I like to include uh, clean, you know, how clean is the environment. I like to include the divorce rate, all other variables that can... Uh, I'd like are... to include Peter before we run out of time here. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, Take I just the wanted last to, to say that I think it would be a mistake to expand the scope of GDP to try to include all I of agree. these other things by ap applying monetary values to them. I think it's much better to put it back in its place. I agree with uh, Chris... Uh, that uh, uh, it still has a use. Um, but let's keep it contained. Let's not make it the number one priority to see it grow. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure we're measuring and monitoring the other things that really matter and gear our policy in both in the private and public sector to that. A friendly discussion friendly with amendment. a friendly, friendly amendment to boot. Well done. OK. Can I thank all of you for coming on a TVO tonight? Chris Reagan, Celine Back, Atif Kabursi, Peter Victor, and Sarah Kaplan. It was great all having you here for this uh, very Thank happy you. discussion. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario and by viewers like you. Thank you.